Statistics. Binomial experiment asking the question, do you own a pet? Yes or no? Get ready and some coffee because if we want to get futuristic, we need statistics. You're not required. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunchy numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Prior to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, we're currently in the OneNote presentation section, 1948 binomial experiment, do you own a pet tab, looking at a scenario similar to recent example problems, except this time we've got the binomial experiment, by of course meaning to, which we will get back to shortly. However, first a quick recap of our general scenario. We want to find information about a large population, but we can't test every item in that population. It's too big. Therefore, our strategy, we want to take a sample, test the sample because it's more manageable, hoping that we can apply the findings found from the sample to the larger population in general. Remembering there's two basic ways that we can think about doing this, one being with the use of the hypothesis testing, the second being with the use of confidence intervals. Hypothesis testing typically lending itself to situations where we think we know the middle point, such as, for example, if you've got that average amount of peanuts on the bag of peanuts, that's what we would expect to be on average in the bag of peanuts. We would build, in essence, our curve around that hypothesis, then take some samples to see if they are further enough away from our original hypothesis in order for us to reject that original hypothesis. Second, we have the confidence intervals, in which case it lends itself to situations where we don't know what that middle point is, and that's what we're trying to find, and therefore the results that we get from the experiment are in essence gonna be the middle point that we're thinking of, and then we're gonna use some way, shape, or form to make our confidence intervals around it. Now, in this particular situation, we of course are using a binomial type of situation, which as we stated, means two, and that's a little bit different than some other situations, that, such as if we were to be testing heights, if we were to be testing weights, then we would basically say heights would give us results such as 5'11", 5'12", 6'2", or something, right? 5'12", doesn't really make sense, but you know, you get multiple responses. Whereas with a binomial experiment, we only have two types of responses. We thought about the most kind of theoretical type of binomial experiment before, the good old coin toss. And now we want to think about something that's a little bit more concrete, which would be a survey type of situation, for example, here, where we're going to ask the question, do you own a pet or not? That's going to be the question. There's only two possible results, yes or no. People will try to say other stuff when you survey them. They're going to say, hey, does it, does, can I say maybe I kind of own a pet, but kind of not because it's like a fish or something like that. So you probably get more specific about what it means to own a pet. Someone might say that their pet rock is a pet or something. It's like, no, pet rocks don't count. It only counts if, you're, if you have to pick up pet crap. That's the only time the pets count. But in any case, yes or no binomial could happen within a survey situation. Many surveys ask the question, did you like the service or did you not like the service? Yes or no binomial as opposed to did you give the service a one to five or a one to 10? Uh, when we have a polling situation, you might have two candidates, in which case you vote for A or B, binomial situation, or asking the question, are you gonna vote for A or not vote for A, right? You can only say yes or no in essence to that because we're not accepting maybe, all right? 
So with a binomial experiment, you will also recall when we're thinking about our data that, that we have the idea that the data itself could be in a bell shape. But in our case, of course, if it's binomial, our data is not going to be bell shaped. It's going to look something like this. It's going to have just two, two bars to it if we were to graph it as, in essence, a histogram. You will recall that we've thought about the idea that we would like to get something in the form of a bell shape because if it was a bell shape, we can define what's under the curve more easily and describe the bell shape curve with just the two numbers, that being one, the middle point, the mean or average, and two, the spread being the standard deviation. Now, we thought about the idea that if our original data is skewed to the left or skewed to the right or is uniform and not in a normal distribution, we can use the central limit theorem saying, well, what if I imagined that we had all possible combinations of whatever sample size and then we took the mean of all that information, that information would tend to be more of a bell shape. That's the idea. So we have a similar kind of thing here because of course there's only two results which means it can't really be bell shaped so what we would like to do is use that same kind of concept based on like the central limit theorem but the calculation will be a little bit different so remember there's two numbers for us to get that bell shaped curve one is the mean now we can think about the mean of the population we can think about the mean of a sample we can think about the mean of all possible combinations of whatever sample size we are picking all of them should tend towards the same central mean point. With the standard deviation, the spread calculation, it's a little bit different. We've got the standard deviation of the population. The standard deviation of the population may or may not be known, by the way. We've got the standard deviation of the sample, which could approximate the standard deviation of the population. But what we're looking for is the standard deviation of, in prior presentations, the X bar, which here we're gonna call it, you could call it P bar, which is basically the standard deviation as though we picked every combination of sample of whatever sample size it is. And instead of us actually doing that, because it would be impossible, we derived this formula. We didn't derive it, but they have, the geniuses have derived a formula in order to do that calculation. So before, if it was not binomial, it would be the standard deviation that we're looking for to graph our bell curve is the uh, sigma, which is the standard deviation of the population. If we didn't know that, we would have to substitute the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of n. n represents the sample size. And then if n is sufficiently large, big N, that being the population, we can usually drop off this second bit, which is typically the case. If we're talking about a binomial situation, it's a little bit different though, because now we can still drop off this typically but because we only have the two, we basically have P, which is going to be the, the percent of the calculation uh, that we're looking for times one minus P, which will be the other part of it, not half, but ratio that would add up to 100 divided by N, uh, which is still going to be the population, the square root of that whole thing. So the, the general concept is the same. But remember, if you have a binomial experiment, the formula is going to be a, a little bit different to get that standard deviation we're looking for, which you can call uh, standard deviation of the P bar and so on. All right, so we're going to imagine the pets. If they own a pet, we're going to say it's a one. We want the percent of people that own a pet. So we're going to make the owning of the pet B1 and the other B0 so that we can basically just count these up and whatever, however one, many ones we get will basically be the ratio of people owning pets to not owning pets. So that's the way we can basically set it up. So you've, if you bar graph it, you've got zeros and ones, and basically you can take the, the ratio, whatever these zeros add up to, uh, and ones, you could take the ratio and give us the percent uh, of people that own pets. All right. So we did a random number generation here in Excel to generate these numbers just between zero and one. So that would mean that we would expect that we're gonna get our numbers that are gonna be around 50, 50% because they were randomly generated a random ones and zeros, remembering that one represents that someone said that they own a pet and zero representing that they do not own a pet. And I believe it's like 50, 50 in the population 
or something like that, I'm guessing. So that's what we simulated here uh, in our sample. Should come up to something similar to 50-50. Uh, okay. So then if we look at our, our data here, we said for the P, owning the pet, we had 151 and then one minus P. There's only two options. So if P is 151, that's what we're going to define our question by people that own the pet. Then the rest of it is one minus P because there's only two options, which came out to a count of all of the zeros, which came out to uh, 149. We counted those with a count if function of the zeros and the ones. And then we can take a percentage of the total. They both add up to 300 because we did a sample of 300. So if we took the 151 divided by 300, we get 50%. So that's going to be, in essence, our average now because in a binomial experiment, only two options we're taking the average being the percent that own uh the pet in this case right the percent that don't own which we're going to call one minus p 149 divided by 300 is 49 or of course if 50.33 owned the pet then 100 minus 50.33 is going to give us the 49 67 that don't own the pet which is why we can define our results by p the percent that we're looking for that own the pet and one minus P being the other option that they don't. Okay. As they, let's go over here and we're going to say, all right. So the proportion that uh, own the pet now, we're going to define as our 50.33. And then we, that means that we can define the people that don't own the pet one minus P. And that's going to be the 4967, which of course we can derive by once again, just we can get both numbers here but we could say a 50.33 own the pet then one or 100 percent minus p gives us the 49.67 that do not so we're going to say the population n uh is 1,400,000 so that's a fairly large population we took a sample of 300 out of 1,400,000 so because that sample is large or the population is large you would expect that you would not need to use the correction factor of the formula, that being this bit, that part of the formula. And so, and we talked about that in a prior presentation, the sample size, we calculated by just counting the numbers and that was 300. And so we have a sample size, we pulled 300 sample out of 1,400,000. The expected P bar, uh, which is basically similar to the X bar, if it wasn't a binomial situation, in other words, uh, our expected like mean or average is still once again that 50.33 and then we can do our test here which is little n divided by big n which is the sample size of 300 divided by 1,400,000 why are we doing that because we want to see whether or not we need to apply the correction factor that would be this part of the formula and normally we do not because normally uh, N is quite large. So even a 300 sample, which is a fairly decent sample, is nowhere near the N population. Therefore, we can drop that second part of the formula and just do the easy bit of the formula. Then we've got the standard error. Uh, so the standard error calculation is going to be like our, in essence, our standard uh, deviation that we're going to be using to create our bell curve. And that's going to be where we use our formula now. Is this where the formula is? Yeah. So there it is. So it's going to be using this formula. So that's now, instead of using this formula, which is if it wasn't binomial, we have to use this formula, which is simply going to be P times one minus P, the two options, the percentage of each option divided by N. And we're taking the whole square root of that. So we have those numbers here here's going to be p that we can plug in boom one minus p boom divided by uh n which is the 300 and we took the square root of that entire thing and that gives us basically our standard error of 0 0.0289 0 0.0289 and then we have is n times p greater than five this uh, is another test to see whether or not we can uh, use, in essence, the, the, the assumption that it's going towards basically a bell-shaped curve. So we want to have the n times p greater than 5 as a check. So if we multiply the n 
a uh, little n times p, 50%, we get something greater than five. So that test has been met. So let's just do it here just for the fun of it. We're gonna say n is 300 times p, which is 0 0.5033. Okay, and then, so that comes out to the 151 about, and then is one minus p, the other side, which is gonna be the 49 points, well, let's say, 0.4967 decimal format times uh, n, which is 300, doot, 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 and that's gonna give us the 149. So there we have that. Now, given that, we can construct a range. So we're gonna imagine the range is basically given to us. So if they say, what is the probability that the sample proportion will be within? So we're gonna define the range and then calculate the probability that it's within the range. So we're gonna say the margin of error is uh, the, the uh, 0.03 given to us. So then we can define our range if that is the margin of error by saying, okay, this is gonna be the middle point that we're gonna imagine in our bell curve graph. And so now we're gonna say margin of error is 0.03, so we're gonna say 0.5 5033 and then mine is 0.03 gives us the lower point of 0.47 and then we're going to take that middle point again which is over here the 0.5033 uh, and then uh, plus the 0.03 is going to is going to give us the 53 the 0.53 so then we have the the p bar calculation so within this range, what's the probability that it's gonna land within that range? So if we have imagined our graph over here, we're imagining that we calculated a range that we have defined now, the middle point is the middle of that range, and we're trying to say how likely is it to, to fall within that middle point part of the graph? So we can do that when we calculate this, we, we use our norm.dist calculations, and the norm.dist is gonna give us the area under the curve from left to right. So if I look at this, we can imagine, we can get the area of the curve up to here, boom. But then we've got this little blue bit that we need to cancel out. So we're gonna add it up to here and then subtract out the area of the curve up to here because the calculations are giving us the information from left to right. So we're gonna say, all right, that means that I, I have the norm.dist of uh, the x, we're taking the upper x, and then the mean, which was over here, and the standard deviation, which was over there, and we want it to be cumulative, that's why it's a one minus the same formula, but we're gonna be now having the x, which is going to be the lower bit of the x, and that gives us the 0 0.70. Uh, and, so, and, so that, and so we can also look at that in terms of the z-scores, so if I was to measure my x-axis over here, we can measure the x-axis in x's or x's up or z-scores. So if I was to do it in, in terms of the z's, measuring in standard deviations, I can look at the standard deviation of each of these points. So this lower bit, I can say that's gonna be 0.47 minus the middle point, which we said was this one, 0.5033 divided by the standard deviation, which is going to be our standard error, 0 0.0289, and that gives us our, uh, that didn't work, que paso. Oh, I know, I think it's because in Excel, these random numbers that we generated over here, I let them just shuffle around, and therefore they recalculate every time I click on something. So this actually might not line up uh, perfectly here, but we'll just get the concept of it because these numbers keep on shuffling around whenever I click on something in Excel. So that would be the general idea that I can measure it in terms of z-scores. And we could do a similar calculation down here. What if I said the margin of error was uh, 0.06? If the margin of error was uh, the 0.06, then we would get, let's see if hopefully this one didn't shuffle around and we get, we get the, the margin of error is the 0.06. So we're gonna say, all right, well then that means that we can take then this middle bit here, 
which is the proportion 0.5033 uh, minus 0 0.06 gives us the around 44 and then I can take the middle point which is 0 0.5033 plus the 0 0.06 which gives us the top bit of our range which is at the 56 so that would be like us measuring the middle point and then the range in terms of x's and then we can do the same thing with the z's I can convert each of these upper and lower into the Z's. Uh, and then we can count the probability calculation, same probability up top. So now we're taking the norm dot dist of the upper X and then the mean, the standard deviation, and it's gonna be cumulative minus the norm dot dist of the lower X. And we get around 0.9623, which is like around, you know, that 96%. So if we were to convert this into Z scores, Remember that generally, if it's a normal distribution, you would expect like 95% to be within about two standard deviations. So if this came out to 96 probability, you would expect this to be around two or something like that, right? So that one looks kind of right. Let's see if I can test that out. I would take this Z, which is gonna be the 0.44 on the lower minus, and then we'll go over here and say minus the middle point of 0 0.5033 divided by the standard, the standard error. Where did that go? It's right here. It's divided by 0 0.0289. It's going to give us that 2.19. So it's still not exact because I think it's shuffled. I think we keep, I can't think it got shuffled around, but you get the general idea here. That's how you basically calculate it. And it's, and because it's around 95 you can see this is around two all right so then we could basically graph this thing we can say all right let's graph it then so when to, when we graph it i want to pick x's i'm going to think about the x's that i need to be long enough that it fits everything on the graph now it's a little tricky in excel because again it keeps shuffling around so that's why i made it a little bit longer and that's why it's a little bit messy here we do this in excel so you can see that in another course or section if you want to take a look at that but we're basically to calculate this we're basically given the idea of well if this is the standard error uh of point uh of point oh two then we're gonna say point oh two eight nine times four and then i'll i'll add that to the middle point which is going to be 0.5033 something like that again it shuffles around is what we would think about as our top point and then we could subtract it to get the bottom point so that we don't have to go from zero to a hundred in order to pick up our all the numbers we need to graph this thing and i i keep on pointing out the graphs because personally i'm not great at drawing these on a paper and pencil but visualizing them is very important. So I, so to me, it's really useful to think about how I can graph it in Excel so I can have a visual to take a look at. So this time I represented the X's and percentages. Now this is a little bit weird too, or different than if it was not a binomial experiment because now we're dealing with basically percentages. So I can represent the X's you know, as percentages going from the 30 up to the 61.88%, we can calculate the percent, which is our norm dot dist uh, formula. And so we calculate this one, this, or here's my norm dot dist. So the norm dot dist is taking the X here, and then we're taking uh, the mean, which is the middle point uh, that we calculated over here, boom. And then we're taking the standard, the standard error, which is boom, that one. And then uh, and then we're making it not cumulative. That's why it's a zero. Now notice if you did that and you copied it down, it would add up to like, I think 10,000. And I'd like the whole thing to add up to like 100 because that just makes me feel better. <laughs> Seems for, and because it's a percent, these binomial experiments, that's always the case. So you can leave it alone. But I, like, I divide the thing by 100 so that my results all add up to like 100%. So I divided it by 100. And so there's gonna be our information. And then we've got the Z scores, which is just calculating the Z so that I can add a second, a second X over here, measuring it in X's or measuring it in the X 
uh, of uh, the Z scores, right? The X values, which are in terms of Z's, <laughs> Z scores, which is basically standard deviations away. So now we've calculated those same kind of way we would take this minus the middle point divided by the standard deviation for each of those. And then in order to get the second bit here, I have to graph something that I can tie it to in Excel. If you want to check that out in Excel, you can take a look at our course or section on that. I wanted to make it within the standard deviations of negative 2.08 to, so Z is greater than negative 2.08 Z score and less than positive 2.08 which is basically this range in terms of Z's, right? In terms of Z's, we graphed it between these two. We could have set it in between, in terms of X's that we want it to be in between these two. And then we did a logic test saying, hey, look, if this Z, we used an, an if and function. So if, and then and, cause there's two logic tests, this thing, this, this has to be greater than negative 2.08 and less than positive 2.08. And if that is the case, we want you to give us this number. That's what we're actually gonna graph. And if it's not the case, we want you to give me just a blank cell. It gave us nothing until this middle point. And then that's what's graphed over here. So this orange bit is the middle point that was graphed, which represents the middle part, which was around, I think we said 96% under there because it's around not exactly two standard deviations, but a little bit higher than two standard deviations is the range that we picked. So there, so you can see that was be within here. The middle point should be right here. And then we've got the tails being the, the last uh, bit uh, on the tail ends. So that's the general idea with the binomial. So the, the general idea with the binomial experiment, similar scenario, we could, but we still, we have to use that second or different formula uh, in order to get that standard error, which is equivalent to kind of like the standard deviations of of like all the different combinations of uh, whatever sample size that we chose.